If you sell by referral, relationship building, and network marketing, pick a time and let's talk about podcasting. You might be surprised. When done correctly, all you have to do is have the conversations. Simply dial 239-351-5575 and ask for Tom. That's 239-351-5575 or go to lawfirmpodcasts.com to schedule a call. Welcome to the NJ Criminal Podcast. On May 30th, 1969, 19-year-old college students Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry were brutally murdered after spending several days vacationing in Ocean City, New Jersey. They were last seen in the early morning hours leaving the Point Diner in Summers Point as they left town to return to Susan's home in Pennsylvania. Their parents reported them missing when they didn't return home on time, and several days later their bodies were found just off of the northbound side of Garden State Parkway exit 31.9. Joining me today is attorney Christian Barth, author of the 2020 book, The Garden State Parkway Murders, A Cold Case Mystery, which is a culmination of almost 10 years of research. Christian, welcome. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me, Meg. I great, greatly appreciate it. Well, I appreciate uh, you taking the time. And I'll, I'll start by saying uh, that you also have a, a three-part podcast that I would encourage uh, my listeners to check out. Uh, it is a link. You can reach a link on your website, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, www.christianbarth.com. Uh, and it's it's uh, very Christian well Barth, done. Christian Barth author. Christian Barth author dot com. That's why I checked. Good. So, let's start by telling me um, first. You know, what what led you to, you know, spend ten years researching uh, and writing this book, uh, and a little bit about just the the basic facts of this unsolved murder. Okay, so the muse for lack of a better term, uh, was summoned in May at least, uh, years back. Um, but as far as the art, we'll get to that. The origins of the story, uh, or my interest in it at least, began when I was about 12, I'm gonna say 13, I could have been 14. We traditionally, uh, as a family, I grew up in Cherry Hill and spent part of this summer, not the entire part, down to the Jersey Shore in Stone Harbor, and then later uh, we had a place in Avalon. So we'd go to Stone Harbor, and, and on these return journeys, we'd always take the parkway down there and back, and as I recall, I'd always just get lost in this reverie when we traveled north. I was sitting in the back seat looking out into the woods um, along the parkway, um, because there's no development there. Um, and just you know sort of have this childhood fascination with it and during one of these return trips home we had driven right past um, a spot along the parkway and i recall specifically my mother saying to my father you know that's they never found out who killed those girls did they and i was my interest was immediately piqued just fascinated me i'm like what girls and they didn't really delve too deeply into the case but i remember my father saying that's true they never did and he said yeah, he was mistaken, actually, in his facts. He said, well, they, they put a trailer up in the woods in hopes that the um, person who did this would come back because the killer always returns to the scene of the crime. And that sort of really piqued my interest. But, you know, like anything else, life moves on. And then I was uh, on and I went to law school. And sometime thereafter, I was taking a writer's course at Rutgers University with, with Lisa Zeidner. And I remember, you know, we obviously were assigned a short story and I was thinking what would make a good short story. And for some reason that came to my mind and I, that wound up being um, uh, a short story that I published in a magazine called Thought Magazine out of San Francisco um, a long time ago. And from then I actually self-published a book called The Origins of Infamy, published in 2009, which was, uh, first person journey into the mind of, of Ted Bundy, um, beginning with his origins and then going all the way to his possible involvement in the Jersey Shore case. 
And then after I'd done that, I had done so much research and preparation for that that I decided, well, why don't I write the nonfiction version of this? So that's, in fact, what I did. And then I researched even more and, and began the process of writing it and interviewing every single living New Jersey State Police detective that would talk about the case who was still alive. Um, and that's pretty much how it came to be about uh, as to how the, how, the, how the story began and, and my interest in it and my beginning to write about it. Yeah, what I, what I found so uh, impressive as I read the book was the amount of detail and, and the number of individuals that you were able uh, to interview that had some involvement in the case, individuals that have now since passed away, different detectives yeah. and, and all of that. So I thought that was very, very thorough and very interesting. Um, you know, you mention uh, in parts of the book that because this is still an open investigation, you know, typically when individuals are doing research, they can file what's known as an, an OPRA request, Open Public Records Act request. But because this is still considered an open investigation, um, my presumption is that you were not able to obtain case files. Is that accurate? Absolutely. So I that really several. limits, yeah, I'm sure that really limited your ability to kind of piece did. together what happened. I know you refer a lot to newspaper articles. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in just your process and how you, before we get into the facts, how you, how you did your research. I filed several OPA requests with the New Jersey State Police in the 2000s. And um, one, I believe, with the Atlanta County Prosecutor's Office, one or two uh, back in um, in the early 2000s as well was obviously politely and summarily rejected um, on both times because of, and, and you'd be aware of this as a practicing criminal defense attorney, the um, uh, active police investigation exception um, to the Open Public Record Act's statute is, is, is pretty broad and, and all-encompassing, and there are really no ways around that so i was limited as far as gathering insiders knowledge of the case and outside of the secondary sources such as um, newspapers to my discussions with retired still alive new jersey state police detect police detectives excuse me like jack kreps george dix um, men who happen to have been really, really involved with the case and have since passed away. So it was fortuitous timing in that regard. Um, earlier when I had mentioned that, you know, I've been studying the case for over 20 years now. And in studying the case and compiling my materials, I had, of course, as I said, written The Origins of Infamy. And after that, and then when I began to do a deep dive into the actual true story, not necessarily my fictional take of it. A lot of the guys that I was able to reach, as I said, passed, but there were other guys that I wasn't able to reach, such as um, Jim Brennan, who was head of, um, I think, the criminal investigation section down there at um, the Hamilton Barracks and was in charge of the investigation. Jim Toth, who was the chief polygraph examiner. Uh, I wasn't able to speak with those guys. Um, the Saunders brothers were two state police detectives heavily involved with it, didn't speak with them. But everyone who was alive and, and the other remaining guys, as they said, I did speak with them. They were extremely generous with their time. There was really only one person who was not, um, who was in fact retired, who I obviously won't mention. But it was just very encouraging know that there are people out there that cared enough about the case and were willing to just devote so much of their time and helping me find the answers and, and assisting me in my search. And, and just from a jurisdictional perspective, you've got the Ocean City Police Department, although um, the girls had stayed in Ocean City, it's not believed that they were murdered in Ocean City, but Ocean City is part of Cape May County. Uh, and then just over the bridge is Summers Point, which is Atlantic County, but then you have the Parkway, which is New Jersey State Police jurisdiction. So I would imagine yeah. even in doing your research, you've got these different agencies. Obviously, New Jersey State Police took the lead on the case, but you've got these different agencies involved. Um, and 
uh, you know, it's it's always easy for someone to pass the buck, I guess, so to speak, when you're trying to, to get information. How did you um, go about uh, obtaining old newspaper articles? And uh, I, I thought it was um, really interesting to listen to uh, old radio uh, pr- uh, publications or radio reports that had been put out at the time uh, of, of this incident. That was very, very difficult. You, you might be referring to there was one radio. I didn't a number of TV, not a lot, a few TV broadcasts. I was able to get transcripts of um, and the actual recordings, digital files of. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as radio broadcasts, when I tell you, Meg, I look everywhere. I mean, I went online. There's these old WFIL disc jockey alumni association rosters, call them. And there was no, and I emphasize, no record of They had none of these tr- uh, old recordings from that time. I thought there'd be a log of them. Right. I really did from that time because who throws away old recordings? And I since learned that, you know, in in the switch to from analog to digital, so much of that stuff, I guess, due to um, basically spacing concerns, inventory and, you know, the amount of real estate you have were were simply discarded. So I wasn't able to get any of that. The one radio reference really was a result of a witness who had contacted me in 2006 regarding Ronnie Walden's involvement in it. And she had in fact heard the broadcast over a Jersey Shore radio station that the girls had in fact been found. And that's actually what um, prompted her to contact the New Jersey Jersey State Police detectives and, and offer a very compelling statement as to who she thought had done these murders. Right. And the reason I'm spending time talking about it is because this this is true crime, and I do think that your book it spent a lot of time giving detail um, that it, that is factually accurate. And that's obviously you're an attorney, you're an author. Um, this is you know, although you had previously in 2009 written a, a fictionalized account, um, this this book is is not fiction. Uh, it is true crime, and so. Uh, that's why I thought it was important to mention that and, and just take note of the research that you did. So tell us, walk us through for our listeners who might not be familiar with the case. Um, tell us what happened uh, in the days leading up to the murder murders of Susan Davis and Elizabeth Perry. Okay, so May 27th, 1969, um, Susan and Elizabeth, who were friends at Monticello College, an all-girls school in Illinois, had decided to venture east in Susan's convertible to uh, go to Ocean City, New Jersey. Uh, I was privy to letters um, from friends of Susan's and of Elizabeth's um, that chronicle just briefly you know, their, their trip east nothing like a day by the account or anything like basically indicating that they wanted to go east and see the beach and elizabeth um, perry who was from excelsior minnesota right outside of st paul hadn't been to the beach um susan who was from camp hill pennsylvania outside of harrisburg wanted to introduce her friends so they drove east and the idea was um to visit uh, the beach for three days at ocean city then proceed northwest just an hour to go and rendezvous with Susan's parents, uh, Wesley and Marjorie Davis, and then go down from there, the four of them, this being Susan Elizabeth and uh, Susan's parents to see Susan's older brother graduate from Duke University. So they drove east on Tuesday, or I'm sorry, they arrived in Ocean City on Tuesday, May 27th, and checked into a boarding house on 9th Street owned by Walter Sybin. It was called the Sybin House registered in uh, the guest registry, spent three days doing nothing really important, not to say important, but nothing that really caused you in retrospect to say, oh, well, that's a clue. That's a clue as to what would, you know, the unfortunate fate that would befall them. And just to be clear, it was just they, the two girls together. Just the two girls together. So they uh, went and they checked in and they went to the boardwalk, went to the beach, uh, you know, Apparently, they went and parked and met a bunch of boys and had some beer and saw on the side of the road. No evidence that they ever went over and 
participated in, you know, the Bacchanalia, for lack of a better term, at Summer's Point at the time, which is pretty much the heyday of, um, you know, the, the, the groups that would go and, and drink and party over at Tony Mars and Bay Shores. So they went to uh, Ocean City, and on the morning of May 30th, when they were set to leave, they were supposed to leave not later in the morning, but certainly at a more, when the sun had come up. And at 4.30 in the morning, they had, I guess, been out two hours, um, and they came back, and it was 4.30, and they had left, and Walter Simon said, why are you leaving so early? And they wanted to get a jump on the road, and he said, well, at least wait until the sun comes up. But they didn't listen to him, and they left. And from there, they went directly to, according to the timeline, the Summers Point Diner right across the bridge of Nosen City um, around 530. It was right when the sun came up. This one of the waitresses um, said that it was just at about 5, 530 when the sun came up and they asked that the uh, blinds stay up so they could see the sunrise. Very, very crowded at the diner at that time. Um, Again, they had people pouring over from all night bars and, and basically the, the kids who were at the Bay Avenue bars would, would walk over to the Summers Point Diner. It was a 24-7, very, very popular place and the only place that was open at that time. So after eating there, they met with a couple of boys who had just joined them at their table. And there was some discussion after the fact that there was you know, a bill being paid and they didn't want to pay it. And there was an argument. There was no argument. Um, they got up and left, and no one saw them leave the diner or get in their car. Um, and s- at, that same morning when they were due to arrive at Susan's parents' home, they didn't arrive, and the parents became concerned, contacted the landlord, the Ocean City authorities, asking what had happened, and that brought up the entire uh, search a uh, 13-state alarm was issued, and that's when everyone got involved looking for them. Um, the fathers actually rented a helicopter and, and swept over the area to see if maybe they'd been in an accident on the side of the road because it was a, a very uncharacteristic of either of these two to leave and you know anywhere without telling them. So that's what that's the first part of what happened um, as to what happened. Now then, uh, that very which would have been May 30th, uh, again, when they left. Well, that was Memorial Day. It wasn't until, I guess, years later that it became a Monday. It was on a Friday that year. And around 8 a.m., uh, Lewis Sturr, state police trooper stationed out of the Avalon barracks, was doing his northern loop, and he saw the car, Susan's 1966 Chevy Impala SS convertible with a top down parked unoccupied on the side of the road did a check um, with NCIC in Pennsylvania Motor Vehicle Database learned that it was mistakenly relayed back to him that it was another owner thought it was abandoned um, and had it towed there was nothing inside it there were no keys there were no signs of mechanical breakdown there was a straw purse in the front seat but he had it towed, and he went on a brief fishing vacation afterward, and it wasn't until he returned on Monday, three days later, that he saw, I guess, on the teletype at the Avalon Barracks that these two girls were reported missing, and, and when he saw what kind of car it was, he immediately said, uh-oh, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I towed that car inadvertently, so there was a mistake there, and, and that's when the search commenced uh, right after. Right, I shook my head when I when I read that it was three days were basically lost because yeah. of that mistake, um, and that was the light blue convertible that he saw parked, which really would have been ultimately in fairly close proximity, correct, as to where the bodies were laid. Oh uh, yes, the mm-hmm. car was was um, the car was located. It, it, again, because the car was towed prior to the arrival of the police and prior to the arrival of yeah, its arrival to the police after they found the body, you know, it's all subject to estimate as to how far from the crime scene the car was located. You know, I've heard 150 feet, 150 yards. It was, but it was it's facing near, northbound, the, facing northbound. northbound and, and if you look at the, there, there are some old photos that there is a deer crossing sign. 
mm-hmm. right out there, and that's where it was parked, somewhere near the area of the two, mar, mile marker 31.9 and 31.8 is where is where the car was was parked. Right, all pre dash cam, all pre body worn camera. So exactly. Just going back a little bit, um, were you able to speak with anyone in the Sybin family? Or no? No, they've all oh, yeah. The, after the fact. After. Right. Okay. I did speak with a brother, um, okay. one of Walter's children, who was able to provide a description of the house, the day-to-day activities of the parents. He obviously, see, there we go. He yeah. was able to relay to me, you know, the, the time, how, how really viscerally impacted his parents were um, mm-hmm. and just distraught as to what happened. Um, moving forward from that point, and then after the fact, um, not in the book, I had spoken with one of Walter um, Sybin's daughters, who I remained friendly with, and she sort of similarly evoked the um, you know, the disposition of her parents and how much how profoundly this this thing had impacted them. You know, sort of an ongoing trauma that they lived with for the rest of their lives. I guess a lot of guilt and, and remorse were tied up in that. Yeah, it, from the sounds of it in your book, it, it sounds like Mr. and Mrs. Sybin had, even though the girls were only at their house, their rooming house or boarding house for three days, had had developed somewhat of a relationship with the two girls. And there's an indication that there were uh, one or more guys that came by that morning early, uh, 4 or 4.30, to say goodbye to the girls, but uh, they were later cleared. Is that right? There, there is. Um, I was never able to ascertain their identities. I had heard they, they had gone to Duke University. There was, they were never under suspicion. I think the girls were out the night before, came back at about 2.30, and then between 2.30 and 4.30, they allegedly had dates, these people, but nothing that I have learned, and I have covered every aspect of the investigation, um, had indicated they were any form of suspect. I was never able to find out who they were mm-hmm. um, either. And then apparently there were two boys who were sitting on the curb across from the street, I guess which is now the Trade Winds Motel or one of the motels down there. And he said, hey, Sue, Sue, and they had known him or not. But mm-hmm. uh, the, the, so nothing really ever came of that. They were never in persons of interest or anything along those lines as far as filling in that time frame between 2.30 and 4.30. And then similarly, the three guys that they shared a booth with at the Point Diner, uh, at least one of them were were identified or was identified, um, and you spoke with them, uh, but they were cleared of any involvement. Uh, That's dis- right. Despite yeah, that was, the recollection that, that there was some issue about the bill. Yeah, in, in fact, the Edward, uh, Mr. McMonagle, uh, was a, a pretty notorious, not notorious, well-known uh, Philadelphia. And he's almost a, he did bench warrants. I don't know how to characterize a specific title, mm-hmm. but I did speak with him, and, and you know, he indicated to me in his recollection of what had happened. It was very consistent with what was reported in the newspapers. And, you know, his big thing was, you know, he and his friends, I guess, drinking, and they, they drove into the met the girls. They thought, they thought they were in high school. They were so innocent. That's they asked one of them, let me see your ID. So it was a very, very innocent uh, interaction. Very sinister about it um, between these three guys. And basically, I guess maybe one of them skipped out on the bill, tore it up and left um, their own bill, that is. And, you know, it, within all these these kids being there, just the old diamond, diamond dash or whatever you call it. But yeah, he, he basically, his, his account of, of the morning he'd met those two was very consistent with what was in the papers. And um, again, they had, they had left um, before the girls did and, and never saw them uh, get in their car or see any suspicious characters or anything like that. There was uh, another individual who was a uh, potential witness who was a security guard um, that was standing uh, on the steps of the diner, presumably as the girls left. Uh, and you actually right. spoke with him. Tell us what what he saw uh, oh, yeah. and, and how Albert, that plays in. Albert Hickey, 
an Albert uh, security guard, part-time and a part-time photographer for UPI. And um, he was out there. Uh, so he said he was out there about 4.30 in the morning with another gentleman I was never able to track down named John Bates. And he said he was out there having coffee at the end of his shift and he saw a convertible drive up and, and some guy uh, with a flight bag, he characterized it as. I guess in the old days, TWA would give you a bag or some sort if you went on one of their flights or the airlines did. And he jumped in with his bag. He said he was about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, shaggy hair, not a hippie, not a straight person. But um, he did say that um, he had a yellow shirt. He was consistent with that. And then he wound up, this person wound up driving off with these two girls. Well, Albert said this to the newspapers first. The, the yellow shirt and, issue? Yeah. yeah. And then... Um, with it and before i get too ahead of the story timeline wise um you know there were there were some you know, some of the persons that i spoke with at summer's point were somewhat skeptical of his account mm-hmm. um his veracity and whatnot i did meet with him i drove down and meet with him in, in 2010 at he had it's called the ideal furniture store down in hamilton on the pike down there near the blueberry farms and whatnot and very nice man, and we had a long discussion, he and his wife, um, about, you know, about that morning. So, um, And in that, in that interview, he said it was a white shirt, right? Because the, the, yeah, that, the reason was, that's important is because a couple, a couple suspects that we're going to talk about were developed because of what was reported as him having said that the individual that, that he thought got in this, in this vehicle with these two girls was wearing a yellow shirt. And I'll also just note very briefly that this location uh, was before the circle uh, in Summers Point was taken out. So he's presumably standing on the steps of the diner, the Point Diner, and looking towards the the circle. Uh, And there was some suggestion that perhaps the girls came out of the Point Diner, made a right, went around the circle, and then went, um, you know, west onto towards the parkway. It was right at the Jolly Roger Cocktail Lounge used to be there, which is right, you know, adjacent to the diner and the Diorios. So um, that's where he said that he had saw them. But again, his, his timeline was questioned and his veracity was as well. But you're right, as far as irony is concerned, that, that did come into play uh, down the road as far as what he said he saw that morning in the yellow shirt. So Monday morning... Once they realize, uh, the trooper gets back from his fishing trip, realizes, hey, this was the the car that these girls were in, Um, then search ensues in that grassy area off to the right of the parkway uh, about how long before the bodies were found. About 15 minutes into the search. Didn't take long. Um, The searchers were on a hand-to-knee search of the area and, and... I mean, Elwood Fonts from Summers Point um, basically stumbled upon the bodies of Susan and Elizabeth, who were located about 10, 15 feet apart. Uh, Susan was discovered face down and completely nude. Uh, Elizabeth was near her and face up. Susan had been wearing a green dress. It was piled along with her other garments neatly beside her, according to a report, and she was covered with leaves and sticks, obviously to conceal her. Elizabeth was entirely clothed with the exception of her underwear, which were missing, and as well as her shoes, uh, which were missing. Um, uh, and she, too, had been covered with leaves. Elwood Fonts, upon discovering the body, blew his whistle, um, bringing everyone there. He said he lost his voice for two weeks thereafter. I attempted myriad occasions to interview him, and he just never, never returned my call. Um, people who know him, and then I did speak with locals, said he was very traumatized by the event still and just didn't didn't feel comfortable talking about it. Understood. There was a watch face found at the scene. Talk to me about that. A watch was found at the scene. 
Um, at that point, it was, and the interesting thing about the watch, and I really did flesh this out with the detectives with whom I spoke, um, because the newspaper account said it was a watch, a partial band was attached. There was um, a red, one of the detectives said he recalled it being a red string attached to it. Um, I've since confirmed with authorities there was no red string. It was a watch face. It was uh, a diver's watch. And they also found Susan's glasses and, and nothing else there. So that's what was found. And they had attempted to keep the existence of the watch, the state police, that is, as what's called a holdback. In other words, keep stuff out of the press. Um, and what happened was, I guess someone had overheard that there was a watch found. So they had to say, yes, there was a watch found as well as the glasses. So it's a and diver's a watch, but without the band. Right. That's Got exactly it. right. And it wasn't until some time later where there was another leak and it turned out that it was disclosed that it was in fact a diver's watch. So I should emphasize that they said a watch was found, but then there was a leak to the press that it had been a diver's watch. And um, that's important because of a guy we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, Ronnie Walden. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Her, uh, Susan's keys when i found this interesting you know they're they're searching this area for clues and um I don't, I don't recall the length of time later but not too long after about a, what a mile or so up the road girls picking wildflowers um right. find susan's keys a mile right. north so tell us what happened there um so it was actually i, I found out um, since the publication of the book. It was, it was a bit longer than that. It was, it was almost four miles what they found. Okay. Um, and so it was well, that's longer. significant. And, yeah, that's far. It is significant. It's significant for a number of reasons. And they initially, they immediately thought that you know, just based upon the limited facts they had in the circumstances and the topography, um, the time this happened, that it was a hitchhiker. The girls had pitched up big things. A hitchhiker, he picked them up, you know, they pulled over, killed him, and then he, he got away. Um, but as far as the discovery of the watch, it really, you know, uh, really put a whole new twist on the investigation. And what I immediately surmised, and, and this was consistent with what was in the newspapers, is that, you know, if a person had been hitchhiking and killed him there, why would he thereafter proceed, whether by getting another ride or walking? you know, four miles and then throw them on the side of the road. Well, let's say if he was hitchhiking, why would he just walk four miles, throw them on the side of the road? It, it, it lends itself to the um, more logical conclusion that they didn't, in fact, meet a hitchhiker, that they were pulled over at some sort by, you know, one or two persons driving a car, murdered, and then the guys, for whatever reason, took the keys with them and for whatever reasons decided, you know, here's a piece of evidence, let's let's throw this out. You know, they didn't steal the car, obviously, they just took the keys, and I have no idea why, threw them out, but yet the murder weapon, which was a pen knife or a paring knife, according to the medical examiner, was never found. Thank you for listening in. Stay tuned for the next part in this conversation. This podcast is not a source of legal advice. No two legal cases are the same. Contact an attorney if you require legal assistance.